There is growing evidence younger people are more likely than their parents to develop certain cancers. New research from the American Cancer Society found at least 17 cancers are increasing in younger adults. The risk of developing some cancers is two to three times greater for millennials born around 1990 compared to baby boomers born in the 50s. And that includes kidney, small intestine and pancreatic cancer. To dig a little deeper into this, we're joined by Canada Tonight's medical contributor, Dr. Samir Gupta. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again this week, uh, doctor. Th I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So 17 different cancers here that are becoming increasingly common among young people. When you hear about that, I, I, I mean, what do you think is going on that's leading to this? Yeah, so, you know, it's, I think the first thing to say, it's not the first study. We've, many studies have now shown this, so the trend is real. Uh, I'd say this is probably the largest study, 23 million records, uh, mostly in North America, mostly in the U.S., and from North America. Um, and as you say, out of the 34 cancers they analyzed, 17 of them are more common in more recent generations. They went from 1920 all the way up to 1990. A lot of potential reasons there. Um, one thing I will say, um, about half the cancers there are, are cancers that we know are associated with obesity. And we also know that obesity rates have gone up uh, in recent generations. So that's one of the theories that might explain some of this, but then what about the other cancers, right? Um, so, you know, lots of different ways to think about this. One uh, potential idea here is that we're just getting better at detecting cancer. Mm. So is it that people are getting it more or are our scans more sensitive? Are we doing more screening? Uh, what we do see is that if you look at the mortality rate, even for many of the cancers where we're finding more cancer, uh, more people are not dying of those cancers. So that's sort of a good news story for many of these cancers. And that, that might mean we're picking them up earlier, might mean we're getting better at treating them. But at least um, for many of these cancers, uh, we're not losing more people. We're, we're getting better at addressing the cancer. Uh, but aside from the obesity piece, look, there's lots of stuff that more recent generations are exposed to that baby boomers and prior generations were not exposed to. Uh, there's more pollution in our environment. Um, we know that our, you know, we have these ultra processed foods. We've talked about that, that have been linked to cancer. We have these microplastics and nanoplastics. Uh, we have these forever chemicals in our uh, food packaging materials. There's just so much that, that's changed mm -hmm. over the generations. And we don't know which of these might be an important carcinogen. In addition to lifestyle, you know, uh, people are more sedentary. Uh, eating habits, uh, antibiotics in food and how that impacts gut cancers lots of different theories on why this may be happening. A lot uh, for people young and old to consider there, uh, doctor. I, I wanted to touch on another subject with you today as well, uh, because we talked earlier this week about women's pain being underestimated. Um, and in the U.S., there's been a change that uh, potentially could help with that, it sounds like, uh, when it comes to the insertion of IUDs, so intrauterine devices that are, that are used for birth control. So federal health officials are saying that they're now recommending doctors uh, counsel women on uh, forms of pain management when they are uh, going to have this procedure done. How, how significant do you think that is? You know, I think that, it, and it's, this is an update of a guideline that was about 10 years old, and they, they looked at the evidence around how to better manage pain at the time of IUD insertion. And, it, you know, there's been a lot about, about this in the media. Uh, a lot of women have come out with their experiences in the, in the uh, you know, in press, on TV, uh, but also now on social media uh, about having a lot of pain with IUD insertion, not having been prepared for that pain, not having had a discussion with their doctor, their doctor not having warned them. And so a lot of people are thinking about this. And I think part of this guideline is to say, hey, look, this is a really effective and important way uh, for, for people to, to have birth control. It's, you know, 99% effective. Um, how can we make it easier for people to have it more accessible um, and easier for women to, to have it with less pain? And so what they've done is they've looked at evidence that's emerged, studies that have been done, uh, many studies recently, looking at better strategies to manage that pain. Um, and I wouldn't say it's a slam dunk, because what's used conventionally is just anti-inflammatory medication, so pills. And I wouldn't say it's a slam dunk, because sort of half the studies show benefit and half don't, uh, with newer uh, or other ways of controlling that pain. And that's really with nerve blocking agents. So injections you might do to block nerves, or topical creams, or sprays, or ointments mm -hmm. you might to, to uh, also numb the nerves in that area. 
And they're saying this should be considered. They're not saying for everyone, but they're saying this should be considered. Right. Particularly if you think the woman's going to have more pain or is worried about pain, you can add this. Well, I mean, it's important that uh, the conversation is, uh, you know, going beyond social media here, uh, doctor, so people can feel a bit more perhaps empowered when they're in this sort of situation themselves. We'll have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your time. Always appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. That's Dr. Samir Gupta, and he joined us from Toronto.